got quiet. That's the purpose is to put them all by the bunch. We are thankful for the presence of each one tonight. This is going to be the last uh, Wednesday night for multiple classes for a little while because next week we're going to have foundations and you're going to enjoy getting to go through that period of worship where we're going to have some young men speaking to us and also uh, <clears throat> these, uh, these uh, young men who are going to be here for the camp will be leading us in prayer, scripture readings, things of that nature. And then uh, two weeks from tonight, we will start our summer series and seventh grade it up to be in the auditorium for that uh, six-week period. I think it's six weeks, maybe seven. But uh, we'll continue through mid-August. And then by the time we get to mid-August, it will be time for the fall uh, schedule. Seventh, be time for the fall uh, quarter to begin for the school of preaching. So the summer is marching along quickly. But tonight, what I want to do is to bring our study of the United Kingdom to an end. Now remember this started out as first and second Samuel and first and second Kings, but we only got so far in first Kings. So I decided, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break from this study and just call this uh, uh, first part of the study of uh, Samuel and Kings, the United Kingdom. <laughs> and then at a later time, not sure when, but at a later time, we're going to study uh, the divided kingdom. And uh, tonight what I want to do, having already studied Saul and David and Solomon, I now want us tonight to consider the one that I believe was the greatest non-literary prophet uh, with the exception of John the Baptist and that was Elijah. Because Elijah prophesied uh, during the reign of the wicked King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And the study of, of these kings in Israel's history is a study of evil. And sometimes we talk about, well, uh, one sin is equal to another, and there is a sense in which that is true. All sin separates from God. Isaiah uh, records, chapter 59, 1 and 2. And yet on the other hand, we find that some of these kings exceeded in their wickedness from some of the other kings. Now we know occasionally Judah would have a good king, Hezekiah, Asa, Josiah. These were all good kings. But overall, the kings of both Israel and Judah were wicked kings. But God raised up prophets, didn't He? First, there were the judges. Samuel was a prophet and the last judge in Israel's history. And then these prophets, we know some of the prophets, uh, such as Nathan, who is the one that reminded David of his serious sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And then uh, when we think about Elijah, we're talking about a man who uh, in many ways must have been like Christ. And I say that based upon what we read in Matthew 16. Jesus said, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? Well, some say thou art Elijah. So there was something about Jesus that reminded those of His generation of that great and notable prophet, Elijah. Now, that tells us something about our Lord Jesus and His ministry. It tells us something about Elijah. Something about Jesus was like Elijah. Something about Elijah was like Jesus. And Jesus and Elijah were both prophets. Jesus was a prophet, priest, and king. Elijah, the great prophet of God. Now, one thing that comes to my mind when I consider Elijah is that he was a man of great, great courage. And I think today that, uh, that we are finding people more and more 
lacking courage. Maybe some of us are lacking in courage. Probably to some extent all of us uh, are not as courageous in certain situations as we should be. But this man was one who would stand alone if he needed to stand alone. Does God ask us to stand even if we have to stand alone? Yes. Is, does it mean that if there uh, are just a, a, a few people who are standing for right, then that must be wrong? No, sometimes there are just a few who will stand for the right. And the vast majority will be engaged in wrongdoing. We know that was true during the days of Noah, don't we? And so large numbers don't always mean right. Usually it's just the opposite. So Elijah learned how to stand. She was the daughter of one Ethbaal. And Baal, of course, was a Canaanite god of rain and fertility and things of that nature. And it's interesting when we find uh, Elijah on the mount called Carmel that Elijah was able through the power of God to put to naught the power of this false god Baal and attacked Baal uh, particularly with regard to his power over uh, the sky, the rain, uh, that sort of thing. Well, he'd call out to uh, these, these Baal worshipers and the priests of Baal would call out for Baal to do something. And of course, God won that victory on Mount Carmel as He always does. But Elisha is called the Tishbite. Verse 1 of chapter 17. What I want us to do is just consider some various aspects in these three chapters where he's mentioned I want us to consider the as some aspects of his life. Now, it was Jesus who said that there had not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but John the Baptist came in the spirit of whom? Elijah, didn't he? So again, we seek some comparisons that would be made. Now, in these opening uh, verses of 1 Kings 17, we're introduced to Elijah and... Uh, and so uh, he was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, it says. And he made this statement to King Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, I want you to remember these two words as we, well, really three words as we study this particular uh, character tonight. We study Elijah. There were times when Elijah preached and God provided for him. Then there were also times when he pleaded with God and God did what? He provided for him. When you consider Elijah, you know there were times when he was the bold preacher. And then you find him down on his knees pleading with God. And I think that's a good example of what a courageous preacher ought to be doing. He preaches and he pleads with God. Preaches to man. Pleads with God. And whether he's preaching or whether he's pleading, God is providing. And I want us to think about that in our everyday lives, whether we preach or not. All of us as Christians can learn from this that we are proclaiming the message of Christ on one hand, powerfully, boldly. On the other hand, we're pleading with God in our struggles to help us. And regardless of what one is doing, preaching or pleading, then uh, God is providing. Now, keep your finger or your marker on 1 Kings 17. But I want us to remember the passage in James, James chapter 5, regarding what that text says concerning Elijah. In James 5.16, James encourages us to pray on behalf of one another. James 5.16, confess your faults one to another. Now what does that mean? That does not mean that like a, a uh, 
uh, a priest, we're having others confess to us, but rather we are confessing to each other our wrongdoings, our faults, our struggles. We sometimes think about confessing our faults as one comes forward in an assembly and is seated and writes out a note, I have sinned, or I've fallen away, or I'm struggling with this and I need prayer. Now nothing's wrong with that, correct? Nothing's wrong with that kind of confession. But James also has in mind that, that we seek out each other to help one another. Here's my struggle. Here's my difficulty. Here's my temptation. Here's where I uh, find myself faltering. Pray for me, brother. And that brother says, well, you pray for me because here's the struggle I'm having. If we're not careful, what happens is this. We come into a place like this where we do sacred <coughs> things. This is a, a house of worship. <coughs> we come into this place and we engage in sacred things. And we want to do that which is holy and we want to live holy lives. But we also need not just to be holy, but honest, don't we? And sometimes in our efforts to be holy, we're not always honest. And so we want to look to each other to find what? Encouragement and help. I like to think through an assembly like this, uh, we gain the strength we need to do what? Make it on through the week. Isn't that really the purpose of Wednesday night Bible study? Uh, just to, to, to help us get through the week, a good period of time between Sunday and Sunday. And faithful children of God like to assemble as a matter of tradition on Wednesday evenings or some other night during the week just for the encouragement we receive. Now, uh, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Don't you see how confession of sin and prayer go together, don't you? Confess your faults, you pray. Confess, pray. Here's what, here, here's my confession. What about your confession? Let's pray. Right? Alright. Then he says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? Avails much. Now if we take God at His Word, then we're just going to have to look at that passage and immediately proclaim, it pays to pray. Right? If God is true, and He is, He doesn't lie. He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One song written, I think, by Brother Sanders. Pray all the time. We hardly ever sing it. But pray all the time because it's effective. Now, give us an example, James, of one who prayed effectually and fervently. Who is it? Elijah. Elijah. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. I don't know if you've got your Bible or not. I don't. I'm not going to desecrate God's book. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's my personal thing. Brother Woods never would write in his Bible, and I'm the same way. Brother Cates used to say I wouldn't want to own a Bible or any other book, but write it, right? Well, you're not, I'm just kidding. You're not desecrating your Bible. If you highlight it, ask you, I just put mine over on a sheet of paper. That's for me. All right. But if you're highlighting, think about that just for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> the day is if you get over, you can't find the paper. And sometimes maybe you can't find your Bible, right? It's in her heart and mind. Elijah was a man, I like this. This is why I say highlight in some way. Or Subject to like passions as we are. Now, think about this. When you see a boy, little boy, headstrong, rough and tumble, likes to get down in the mud and play, and he plays ball, and he's just running around like a tornado, and I mean having a good time, we say he's all boy, right? He's all boy. I'll tell you this about Elijah. He was all human, wasn't he? I like this passage because I hold Elijah... Uh, in high esteem, don't you? Great, great prophet of God who was subject to like passions as we are. 
tempted just like we are. Flesh, blood, bones. He had his moments of, of greatness. He had his moments of weakness. He was, he was subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And I, I believe that, it, that, that uh, this prayer was answered. It didn't have to be answered in a miraculous way. It just didn't rain. And there are times when it doesn't rain, right? And then he prayed again that it might rain. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Can prayer bring about rain? Well, if it doesn't, why have we wasted prayers through the years, right? Asking God to help us during a drought. Bring us some rain. And Christians do what? When it rains, they say, thank you, Lord, for the rain. And that wasn't done miraculously, but God brought it about. And so we're going to look at this account here in just a moment in 1 Kings, in this section of Scripture we're studying. James just brings it to our recall to remind us of the power of prayer. So we take that and we go back over to 1 Kings chapter 17 where we're introduced to Elijah. I remember a grandson of my uncle, actually I think it was his great-grandson, who, who kept listening to all the prayers being offered unto God for rain. And my great-uncle uncle was a retired farmer still has a great interest in farming and gets concerned when there's a drought. He's also a faithful child of God, an elder of the church. He believes strongly in prayer. And after an extended period where it didn't rain, then the heavens opened. And he said, that little great-grandson of mine got out there in the middle of the rain, middle of summer, thank you, Lord, for the rain. Right? He said, the rest of us hadn't even thought about pausing and, and, and thanking God for the rain, but he thought about it. Well, let's notice in 1 Kings 17, here is Elijah, and he is engaging with old Ahab. And then in verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens uh, to feed thee there. Now, here's the problem. Here's, here's, here is the, the preacher. Here's to King Ahab. It's going to be a drought. And so, and that's the proclamation, isn't it? That's, that's the preacher. Here's what's going to happen. All right? Isn't that what preachers are supposed to do? Isn't that what every Christian is to be doing to the world around them? Here's what God says is going to, to happen. And so, he makes this prophetic statement here. Prophets are foretellers and foretellers. And he makes a prophetic statement here. I can't say uh, prophetically how long we're going to have a drought when it's going to rain again but Elijah could because he's a prophet and then notice that after he preaches then God makes provision does it? here's what I want you to do I want you to go by this particular brook and there here's what's going to happen you you're going to find some water there I gonna be water anywhere else people will be hard pressed to find water but you'll find some water there and you'll likewise uh, have ravens bring food to you. But if I'm hungry, I don't guess I mind if ravens bring food to me, right? That is how God's going to provide for him. Well, now that's just one example. As First uh, Kings 17 begins. Now, here's another section beginning in verse 8. We've looked at the first section, 1 through 7. Here's the second section that we want to consider. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. There's a widow woman that God wants to take care of Elijah. Now, sometimes I think the Bible was written in Southern. It'd be fine just to say widow, but down in Alabama we say a widow woman, right? Well, a widower is a man, a widow is a woman, but a widow woman, that's what the big text says, King James text here. Uh, a widow woman is there. She's going to take care of you. Now, was that, was that widow woman concerned about the drought? She was indeed. Matter of fact, she was not sure whether or not she could spare anything because she also had a child, didn't she? And so, so uh, Elijah asked for something to eat and she said, uh, you know, she's afraid for her son and for herself. And we may die, Elijah said, you don't have to fear anything, verse 13. 
Go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore thereof a little cake first, bring it to me, and after make for thee and thy son. Now here's a test of faith, isn't it? You go and make that for me first. I'm the prophet of God. You're not going to starve. There's the preacher. All right? He's saying, here's what you need to do. I have confidence in my God. Here's what I want you to do on my behalf. And I assure you, I assure you that you're not going to starve. And look at verse 15. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. Now what's going on here? This is a tough time, isn't it? This isn't easy. Now sometimes we think, well, if, God's, if God is, is, is on our side, why am I not prospering more? Listen, listen, Elijah says, when it's a drought, and I'm sitting down here by this river, and I'm getting ravens bringing me food, and there's some water to drink, I'm a blessed man, right? I'm blessed. Some people were starving. Here he is now with this widow. They're not prospering as the world considers prospering, but they got food to eat, don't they? And there's a roof over the head. So, so she went and did according to the saying about of Elijah, and she, her child, Elijah, all oh, they had plenty to eat, or at least God made provision for them. Now, let's notice uh, chapter 17, and notice, uh, uh, or let's just continue in in verse 17 of chapter 17. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. I right, know what did, what did he do when he came to the widow of Zarephath? He made a proclamation. He's the preacher. Here's what you need to do. Go prepare me some food. Oh, wait a minute. We'll start. No, you won't. I've made sure the Lord will provide for you. Now then, there's, there's going to be Elijah pleading with God again. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore there was no breath left in him. No breath left in him. What does that mean? You, your dad, right? Uh, you're dead. So there's no breath in it. And so uh, she becomes uh, uh, very, very upset with Elijah. She says, what have I to do with thee? O oh, thou man of God, are you coming to me to call my sin to remembrance to slay my son? She says, sir, I, I'm, I'm scared to have you here in my house. She says, I, I, you're, you're bringing before the Lord evidently former sins I've committed. And I'm very, very afraid. He said, give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where, where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And notice the pleading in verse 20. He cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Now think about this just for a moment. Because Elijah is courageous, Elijah is loyal, but we get glimpses of something else that happens in the heart and life of Elijah. And that is Elijah could get so distressed. And understand why. Understand why. Here's a man who very much trusts in God, but he's stressed. And sometimes he takes this before God as he pours out his heart. Now some people might be under distress, under stress, and they never think to stop and pray. Elijah's not one of those. But Elijah had such a marvelous relationship with God, he'd just take that problem right to heaven's door, wouldn't he? Lord, have I done something? And, and this is not going to be the first time we hear him uh, speaking that way. Sometimes we talk about his pity party. Well, we haven't seen anything yet, but here is a glimpse of such because, you know, he says, he, he, he said, Lord, have you brought evil upon this widow with whom I sojourn? What, what has she done? What, what, have you done this? And he stretched himself upon the child three times. He's still calling on God, isn't he? And he said, I pray thee, let this, this child's soul come unto him again. The body without the spirit is what? Dead. And so the soul has departed. That means he's dead. He's no longer breathing, but his soul is also departed. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came unto him again. And notice this, he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber of the house, delivered him unto his mother, and Elijah said, See thy son liveth. Now think about this just for a moment. Here, are, here is this woman, a widow. She's suffered before, hasn't she? She lost her husband. Maybe she's lost children. Maybe she's lost her parents. I don't know. And then she lost this boy. She may be a, 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 a younger widow since this boy appears young. 
And so uh, she needs a break. <laughs> and the Lord intervenes on this occasion. And Elijah says, See thy son liveth. And notice how this built up the faith of this woman. The woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. This confirmed what he was saying. Was that necessary during that time? Yes. We don't need anybody to do anything like this for us today to confirm the word. We've got it right here. I don't care what happens in the city of Memphis, in the United States of America, or the world, that how large a catastrophe, God's Word is true. It, God's Word is true. It does not need to be confirmed by anybody. It already has been. Alright? Revealed the Holy Spirit, the Holy Men of God. When they spoke, they wrote, and we have God's Word today. Alright? Now, this woman is assured, you are really in truth. Just who I thought you were. The man of God. Now what has is, what is Elijah done? He's been preaching. And God's provided. Sometimes what does he do? He's pleading. And God still provides. We get into chapter 18. It came to pass after many days. Think about that just for a moment. Just zero in on those words many days. Think about your prayer. I prayed for this for I don't know how long. Three days straight. I haven't got an answer yet. Sounds like the only died. I'll start a diet, and after three days, I'll be complaining to Alicia. I don't believe I look any different than I did three days ago, right? Now stick to that, don't you? Now, after many days, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I'll send rain upon the earth. Remember, it's been a drought. You go see, see old Ahab. I'll send rain. There's a good man, though, that has to work for old Ahab. His name is called Obadiah. Obadiah, not the prophet, but a good man who, who, who's the governor of his house. And the text says there in verse 3, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And so, you know, one time, verse 4, what did he do? He gets the prophets in the pit. Because Jezebel wants to slaughter all of them. And he hid them. Did that take some courage? I'm going to tell you, you do something like that when you're having to deal with Ahab and Jezebel, you know, what is the one name, if you really want to attack uh, and, and talk about and make it put emphasis on a bad, bad woman, what do you call her? Jezebel. Jezebel. And so she's one of the most odious women in history, and certainly in all the Bible. Now, uh, Obadiah did what was right. He protected uh, them. Now, uh, Elijah wants Obadiah to help him out. And uh, he says, I need to see King Ahab. And, you know, uh, Obadiah hasn't seen Elijah in a while. He's fearful of what he might say to King Ahab. What if Elijah maybe doesn't show? But he says, verse 15, Elijah says, The Lord of hosts liveth before whom I sin. I'll surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So Obadiah arranges this meeting with Ahab. He's faithful to the king to the extent that he can be. He's more faithful to the Lord. But you know, Obadiah has, has had some days where he was scared. But, I, I mean, he, he, he knows how great and powerful is his God, but he also knows how vicious Ahab and Jezebel are. But he arranges this meeting. Now don't you love this? You've heard sermons about this before. Oh, Ahab sees Elijah. What does he say? Are you the one that's troubling Israel? You know, in this politically correct world, whether it be in religion or in government, whatever it may be, this, what's sometimes called progressive liberalism, does more damage to people's lives than anything else. What they do is they go in and they destroy churches and they destroy economic systems and then they say, now that we've destroyed it, we want to come back in and fix it. No, you destroy it. So you can't fix it. Here's old Ahab an idol worshiper. He is the
the one who's responsible for the conditions in Israel. And what does he say to the man of God? You're the one troubling us. You're the problem. And I'll tell you, young people in particular, you better, you better be aware of who the troubler really is. Okay? Because sometimes you're going to be called a troubler and you're going to hear of others who are the troublers when it's really the ones doing the name calling that are the troublers, right? That's it. You better be wise. And so Elijah, he, he doesn't back down here. What does he say? He, he says, I'm not the one who is troubling Israel. You are. And your father's house. Because you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you followed Balaam. That's courage. Here's the reason. Here, here's what's troubling Israel. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge of the preacher, Elijah. The challenge is this. He says, you, you, you get those prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel. Let's, let's just, you know, how long, here's what he says to the people. How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you vacillate? When are you going to make up your mind? Sermon in that too, isn't there? Verse 21. If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. The people didn't say anything. You know, sometimes people are so overwhelmed, all of a sudden they just stand there. Can't you just see them all there with, with that courage of Elijah? You see somebody that comes along that's got some courage, it'll just make people stop in their track and they just stand there. They're just standing there listening to, oh, did you just hear that? We're going to have a contest now, aren't we? And there was a contest. One between 450. Exactly. It's God, isn't it? It's God with Elijah, so you can't beat him. But here they are. Well, you, 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 you cry out. You, you, you cry out unto to, to God. And uh, and so uh, and unto Baal, rather. And we'll see who we, we'll see who answers. And so uh, so they build this altar. And they start crying out to old Baal, verse 26. And they leaped upon the altar. Wouldn't this have been funny to watch? In a what? It's sad, but in a way. They start jumping up and down on, on the altar and asking for Baal to, to send fire down out of heaven, right? So they're jumping up and down on it. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Now, you know, we need to keep everything in its proper perspective and in context. What do we say to our children? Don't be mocking anybody. That's right. We should do that. Uh, we say, he always be respectful of people. That's all. But this text makes it clear there are some people and some that are so foolish all you can do is what well, mock it and here's what you've got a righteous man alive he mocks them cry aloud he must be asleep wouldn't you love to heard that he must be asleep maybe you need to wake him up maybe he's taking a far journey you know that sarcasm evidently can be used or yeah he must be out of town nothing's happening and the text not only says that this is this shows you how depraved some people can become. They cut themselves. They started cutting themselves. You know. To the glad. There's some young people today who, who like to cut themselves and pierce themselves and all this kind of stuff. I want to say, that's foolish. That's what foolish people do. People haven't got any better sense. They used to do stuff, into, they called it the sissy test. And you take an eraser and you rub that eraser right there, you know. And I started trying to do that one time at home, you know, because I didn't want to be called a sissy. And my mom said, I'll make you think sissy when you, you get some blood poisoning in your system. And I'm more scared of her than I was the fucking school. And I stopped that business. Don't be doing that. Cutting themselves. And still crying out. Well, we know what happened. When they got finished, Elijah gave them their opportunity. And then we know that indeed, I mean, he, he, he poured water all over that thing and, and, and then the fire came down from God. And I mean, it, it, uh, uh, the, the fire lapped up all that water. And what happened? Those prophets of Baal were shown to be false. And the preacher found provision that they did. He did. Now, he's riding high. Kill all the prophets of Baal. He is in a position here where, you know, you think 
that uh, that there's no way he can be defeated. God has brought him through this. But what happens in chapter 19? Did I get chapter 19? He is running for his life from one woman, right? Now what does he do? He starts pleading with God. I'm all alone. Nobody cares. Just let me die. Did he really want to die? No. He'd been running for his life. That's what we call Elijah's pity party. The point in the message tonight for you and me is this. We need to be proclaimers, right? That's what Elijah was. Whenever he proclaimed the Word of God, God provided. Then he found himself in situations at other times where he's down on his knees doing what? Pleading with God. Pleading with God. And the point is, God provided. Didn't he? And so... I know this. I've preached a lot of sermons. And I've been honored. And I know you have too. In your own personal lives, you, you have proclaimed Christ by word or by example. God provided, didn't He? And then also every one of us have been down on our knees pleading with God after before. I don't know what the need may be, but plead. And God also provided it during those moments as well. How can we learn from Elijah? We can learn from Elijah because of what James said. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. And therefore we can learn from this great Old Testament character. Alright? That's our class for this evening. And I'll let you know soon what we're going to study next. Thank you very much. After August 1.